Hi there colleagues, welcome to my presentation on dyscalculia. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. I hope it proves worthwhile for you and can inform some of your future practice in regards to inclusive mathematics. Let's get into it. First of all, we'll just start with a quick overview. During this presentation, I'll try and shed some light on what dyscalculia is and what the characteristics are of learners with the disorder. Then I'll venture on to discuss how these characteristics may impact student learning in mathematics before identifying some teaching strategies and approaches to promote inclusion of students with dyscalculia. So what is dyscalculia? How many times have you had a student who is struggling with mathematical concepts and no matter how hard you tried, they could never really grasp the concept? Perhaps it looked a little like this. I think it's already starting! Okay, Hi. here's your homework. Um, first let me tell you the directions. Um, what form take away five? One, two, three, four, five, six. Take away. What's six take away one? One. No, you take away, so you take away one out of six, how much does it equal? What's five, ten minus one? I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. Nope. Take away one. How much is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nope. One, two, two three, four, five, six, six seven, seven, eight. And eight. One, and one more. And add one more. How many is it equal? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One. It equals, it makes nine. See how you take away? You take away one, and it equals one. Mm hmm. Do you get it now? Yes. The footage I've just shown you was taken from a YouTube series called Kid Snippets. The concept for this channel is quite interesting as they record conversations between children and translate it into a storyline with professional actors. I found this video particularly fascinating as it demonstrates the frustration of a child who has relatively decent number sense trying to teach a student with poor number sense. I know that I've been in a situation like this before, although my voice wasn't nearly as high pitched. It can be frustrating for both the student and the teacher when the student cannot grasp a specific concept. And in this example, the student may be suffering from dyscalculia. Hanel identifies dyscalculia as a term used to describe specific difficulties in mathematics. She states that pupils with dyscalculia often fail to acquire essential concepts that underpin skills in performing mathematical procedures. Sometimes the disorder is labelled as developmental dyscalculia, suggesting that it is developmental rather than neurological and is acquired through accident, illness, poor teaching or other circumstances. Yitzchak defines developmental dyscalculia as a specific learning difficulty affecting mathematics skills and numerical competence found in children who do not have acquired neurological injuries. What is surprising about dyscalculia is the amount of people it affects. In a study in 2007 conducted by Shalev, researchers found that developmental dyscalculia was prevalent in 6% of subjects tested who were unaware of their disorder. This equates to at least one child in every typical classroom. With this amount of undiagnosed students, students could possibly remain unaware of their disorder and just consider themselves to be bad at math. I want to show you a short video, six seconds to be exact, that went viral earlier on this year. The video features a father telling his son he is stupid because he doesn't know what 9 plus 10 equals. Let's watch. You stupid. No, no. What's 9 plus 10? 21. You stupid. This clip went viral 
and quickly became a source for multiple pop culture references. For example, I just want to know your name. Twenty-one. The fact that this video became so widespread so quickly is a testament to how people do not view dyscalculia as a serious problem. Rather, if you possess little or no number sense, you are classified as stupid. I wonder whether the father would have posted the clip if his son had made an error with his literacy instead. I do, however, find it ironic that the father titled the clip You Stupid, spelt S-T-O-O-P-I-D. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the characteristics of dyscalculia. Hanel identifies mathematics competencies in five areas. Number sense, visual spatial skills, language skills, concentration and memory. Characteristics or indicators of dyscalculia generally fall into one of these five categories and the mathematics learning of the students with dyscalculia will be impacted due to the deficit of one or more of these core areas. Let's start by having a look at number sense first. Students with dyscalculia may be unable to supertize, even with small numbers, estimate whether a numerical answer is reasonable, count backwards reliably, and have trouble with sequencing. A specific example of their inability to supertize would be if they were unable to recognize three pairs on a plate and they had to count individually to know how many that were there. The next area of mathematics where they may have a deficit is their visual spatial skills. Mental manipulation of graphic images may be difficult for the pupil with dyscalculia, so symmetry, tessellation and geometry may all prove to be real challenges. Students with this deficit may experience difficulties with their visual and spatial orientation, directional confusion um, of left and right, and may have a tendency to not notice patterns. Students may demonstrate this lack of visual spatial awareness by encountering problems while copying a shape as a drawing or by reversing numbers. Next we have language skills. As mathematics has its own language, many concepts are bound to specific mathematical language. Hanel states that pupils with learning difficulties such as dyscalculia may have difficulty in monitoring their own learning through internal language-related thinking. As a consequence of this lack of knowledge and understanding of the vocabulary, students may not ask for help as they cannot put into words what they do not understand. This has significant impacts for the teacher as the student may fool the teacher into thinking they have understood the concepts when really they just don't know how to express their thinking. The penultimate mathematical skill which presents as a deficit for students with dyscalculia is memory. A study conducted by Klingberg in 2013 found that students with dyscalculia showed lower brain activity than students without dyscalculia when performing visuospatial working memory tasks. Hanel states that this deficit in memory is present in dyscalculic students and extends to both short and long-term memory. Poor visual spatial working memory may limit the student ability to mentally capture an image and may restrict or prevent them from visualising tools such as timelines. The final skill we'll look at is concentration and what this means in a mathematical context. 15 to 20 percent of students with dyscalculia present with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD which results in behaviour such as students who swing their legs or find things in the classroom to fiddle with or even students who leave their seats to examine something of interest. As this percentage of students will already have difficulty focusing from their ADHD, adding a layer of mathematical concepts and activities which are beyond their comprehension may prove difficult as the student will have nothing known to engage with. Now that we have identified some of the characteristics of a learner with dyscalculia, it is important to know what to do as a teacher in order to promote inclusion of these students and celebrate their participation and input in the classroom. As with all students, it is a good idea to start from a level where the student has developed a good basic understanding, where they'll be able to answer quickly. A specific example of this with a student who has dyscalculia and is experiencing difficulty with ordinality is to question them about numbers they know, as they should be able to say how old mum is, for example. From there, you could introduce mathematics, voca mathematics vocabulary by questioning, who is older, mum or you? Which could even segue into a conversation about bigger and smaller numbers. 
Hanel also insightfully points out that as well as an appropriate level for the tasks issued, the quality and volume of the tasks are vital. Giving students with dyscalculia adequate or extended time to complete the activities is important to consider, as students with dyscalculia often work slowly. Additionally, to support inclusion in the classroom, a teacher could introduce a range of strategies in which the whole class can use, but will be specifically beneficial for the development of number sense and explicit skills, which hopefully will in turn extend practice and alleviate the impact of the disorder. Emerson and Bapti have identified some strategies which dyscalculic pupils may use. These include finger counting, sub-vocalising, which is um, talking under your breath, mantras, which are helpful if they are remembered correctly, tally marks um, and visualising, as well as counting all, which is essentially counting by ones, counting on, step counting, bridging and reasoning from known facts. And reasoning from known facts um, has proven beneficial for students with poor memories. Using strategies such as these are beneficial for the entire class and celebrate and support students with dyscalculia by valuing their involvement. In terms of inclusive assessment for dyscalculic students, and indeed all students, it is important for a teacher to look for evidence of mathematical thinking, estimation attempts, self-correction attempts, and signs um, of the use of appropriate mathematical tools such as rulers. In order to maintain student self-efficacy, graded work with positive and emerging examples of student understanding are much more inclusive to students than a worksheet with ticks or crosses based on right or wrong answers. Hanel suggests that a positive strategy for students with dyscalculia is self-assessment, where they can tick the ones they think are 100% correct, and the teacher can let the errors and omissions tell the story. In closing, thank you for watching my presentation on dyscalculia. I hope you feel informed and can see the benefits for your students in identifying the characteristics and incorporating some of the strategies to assist in creating an inclusive mathematics classroom. If you wanted to access any of the references I've used, I will include a copy of them in the script attached to the video. I'll leave you with these two books, however, which may prove useful um, to be a reference for you in the future. They will be included in APA reference format in the reference list with the script. The first one is Dyscalculia Assessment um, by Jane Emerson and Patricia Bapti, and it contains a brilliant detailed plan for how to conduct a thorough diagnostic assessment of dyscalculia. The second is titled The Dyscalculia Toolkit, Supporting Learning Difficulties in Mathematics by Ronit Bird, and I strongly recommend this book as it includes over 200 activities and 40 games for students aged 6 to 14, which focus on developing number sense and combating the impact of dyscalculia. I'll leave you with the books, and best of luck incorporating some of these strategies in your classroom. Cheers!